All right. So, hello, Chef Wayne. How are you? I'm great. How are you doing, Chef Erica? I'm good. I'm good. I want to. Uh, there I she made it. Is. Hello. <laughs> Barely. Woo. We made it. Okay. We made it. We got. I got to get it started. Okay. <laughs> we are going to push live. Did you end the broadcast? No, I didn't know we were already live. But all right, I'm here. We are live, and um, I just want to. Usually, Wayne, we talk about our past week, so I think you can kind of jump in that with us. And um, um, we're gonna, she's gonna run away really quick. But um, how was your weekend? The weekend was good. Okay. Um, little snowy up in this part of the world. Right, right. And that part of the world and many other parts. <laughs> yeah, well, the difference is we have probably like five trucks that have shovels on them to get snow off the road where you know, in Denver, you know, they have a, a fleet. They just put them out and clear the roads and no problem. Right. That does not happen in Seattle. So. It's crazy. So it was, it was fun, though. We got kind of snowed in a little bit. Okay. We doubled out. Um, um, you know, our kid had a snowball fight, and that was kind of cool to watch. And, you know, it was good. It was good. Right, right, right. That's awesome. Um. Also, how is, there she is. Hi, Chef Shanita. Hello. <laughs> Hi. It was, I was running today. Yeah. Well, Shanita, tell us, how was your weekend? Um, my weekend was good and lazy. Oh. Uh, nice. Like, <laughs> nice and lazy. Wow. I complex, and I just relaxed, really. It's really about okay. all. Well, well, happy, but happy belated Valentine's Day. And the, Thank chocolates, you, sir. the chocolates looked wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. I I did for in, within two weeks. I did five thousand bonbons. Whoa. I know. I don't know how I pulled it off, but I did, and I'm quite proud of myself. Um, my little company, Simply Erica, is pretty rocking. Is I'm taking my time with it, but um, I'm loving every bit. So thank you for the happy belated Valentine's saying to you and to Shanita. Um, I'm trying to recover from <laughs> being on my feet and opening a new coffee shop at the same time. So <laughs> wow, wow, yeah, it was a lot. Yeah, it's kind of it's it's kind of cool to um, and I thank you both for having me on the the show. It, it's kind of strange and kind of weird and kind of at the same time. It's like. I have so many questions for you guys, but I know, I know. First of all, first <laughs> questions first is this, we miss our Februaries together. Yeah, That's we right. did. This is kind of like us getting our our scheduled February trip in. So I guess I could use that into like <laughs> the whole introduction, right? Like how we got, like how does she get from Florida and I get from Kansas to Seattle? Like how does that even all happened right. how do we get to like where you're you know where you are now it's been a we've watched you kind of evolve with your career um and we well, kind of tagged along yeah and every and every um environment that you've been in and we appreciate that we we're, we learn from you so much every time that we get with you you know what well, well thank you and you you know you know erica we we go way back. Yes, we do. And, and we've held each other up. We've done different things. We've done all kind of benefits. Chef Shanita, when I met you, and you just jumped right in and came out to Seattle, like, yeah, I'm coming. Y'all tried to freak me out at Ray's. That's where I first met you, working. Try. I was like, now how do they have me doing a croaking bush underneath <laughs> the air conditioner vent? In a cold kitchen. And I'm like, I got on, I, I need to find the picture of me with a scarf and like my chef coat. And like, I wasn't ready. I, I came out there completely unprepared for the chilliness of the weather. We, we did not want the chocolates to melt. No, we didn't. We didn't. But you know what? Every time that we would come out and um, it, everything turns out wonderful in the end. I mean, we, we have a little battle in the beginning and then boom, within 24 hours, we have 14 desserts ready for you to auction off for your nonprofit of whichever that we were doing. So it was amazing. 
Right. Totally so amazing. they followed you from race to Fair Start, which is that's when I first kind of like saw that concept of what you're doing now. And it was just like, wow, okay, this is fun. And then that was nice because then we came back consecutive years and we got to see the evolution of the students, you know, from one year to the next year and, you know, them and even further on them coming back. And now they're like way past students and they're volunteering. And so it was, a, uh, you know, I don't know. That's kind of what piqued my, that you, you planted that seed for me, even though I wasn't mm. the space in my career to really like navigate that, but you did put it there. And I was like, hmm, this is something. Let me put this in the back of my brain for now and come back to it later. So tell us about what you're doing now. And well, can, yeah. I, all can, the amazing I, can I mention that I think the real journey really kind of started with um, the, May, the Mayflower Hotel. That, that is correct, that is that correct. Is the beginning of the journey. Um, so yeah, so maybe I'll, I'll give you a little backstory of um, how I got to Seattle and, and how I got to um, really wanting to lift up and, and you know, help out underserved, underserved communities. Um, so I, I, when I came out here to Seattle, that was in 1999. My, you know, I'm, I don't know if everybody knows who I am. I'm Chef Wayne Johnson. <laughs> um, so I came up to Seattle in 1999. I worked for a, a hotel restaurant. <clears throat> and when I say hotel restaurant, it was more than just the restaurant. There's room service, there's catering and, and such. But um, the Mayflower had a, a very strong and beautiful Mediterranean restaurant. And I had just studied um, up in Napa, foods from Spain, Mediterranean flavors. And I'm just like fresh in my mind. Yeah, yeah, I want to try this out. The GM called me up and said, hey, would you want to come out here and work? I lost my chef. And I'm like, whoa, ye. well, yeah. I mean, but nervous because I was in California. It's not, not like I was coming across the street. I was like, pack up everything, let's go. Um, <laughs> so started with that, and the Mediterranean thing really took off. Um, I was able to take those flavors, those understandings I had learned, and really um, expand on what that restaurant had already um, kind of laid ground for someone like me who wanted to experiment, but at the same time had the background to put together some really good food. Um, it was amazing. It was fun. A uh, couple of trips to Spain and back. You don't have to brag um, about it. We're not traveling right now. <laughs> well, that's why we need to talk about it so we can, exactly. can we experience. We can take we ourselves there. We can on trips we can't take. <laughs> <laughs> well, I learned a lot about foods from Spain. Mm -hmm. you know, I had the opportunity to cook with like four different chefs in five different kitchens. Mm -hmm. And it was just, it's on. I mean, y'all know, y'all, it's, it's like your everyday work. It's like yeah. 12 full on hours of just, killing it right um came back redid the whole menu into a whole pincho style so pinchos um are small or you might call them appetizers in the states but they're called pinchos in spain and what we developed was so you could like develop your own plate through pinchos mm -hmm. so for instance I, i'd have a, a potato dish which was in itself a dish, but then maybe I had some sort of um, a seafood dish, small, like a, a risotto. So you could put this thing together, and what you did was you built your own plate. The reason I did that was because um, I did something that a lot of chefs do and go to the server station and watch when plates come back and see what's being not eaten. Big portions, lots of food coming back or going home. So when we went to this Pinchos, this tapa style menu, people were only ordering what they wanted. So if they wanted the asparagus, they ordered the asparagus. If they wanted the, the, the croquette, the potato croquette, they ordered that. Right. Amazingly enough, plates came back completely. 
we have a Spanish restaurant here that's similar. And when a group of my and my friends go, I almost feel like we might spend more money because we're like, oh, let's get one of these. And oh, let's get that. And let's get that. And then we look up and there's like this whole table full of food. And we're all, you know, like trying and mixing and matching. And it's great. So that's an amazing concept. Yeah, I, I, I do like that. So um, ended up, um, Erica, when I met you, <laughs> this is, well, this is how it happened, right? It, yeah, it is. It is. Black Enterprise Magazine came out naming top chefs in the country. Yeah. Eric and, and I were was... two of the four. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I thought it was cool just being in the magazine. Right? I'm, 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 you know, checking out everybody else, and it couldn't have been more than two weeks later. I got a phone call from someone out of Florida. I'm like, what? Like, hey. I didn't know there were any black chefs in Seattle. We got to talk. Yeah. That is how I got to meet Erica. And it was just all of a sudden, this we have to do something on a national level to raise money for um, culinarians that were not able to pay for their, you know, their, their way through culinary school. We want to make sure that. Yes, that's important. Yeah, culinarians, you know, these young, Black culinarians were able to get through school, and and didn't want money to be the issue. And also, also have a mentor or someone to look up to, um, because it was amazing. The when that magazine came out, then Ebony magazine came out, and I hadn't been in a room with all black chefs ever in my life, and that changed my entire life. And then seeing you and Marcus and Jeff Henderson. And I had already knew I found I met Jeff right after I met you. Um, mm -hmm. And it was just like crazy. It was, so was it before or after you did Iron Chef? This after. was before, before. Yeah, that was before. before. Okay. Yeah. yeah. We don't have to talk a lot about that. I just wanted people. No, you know, you know it, the, the fun thing about it was that we, we got together and got to really, like Erica just said, be in the room with some amazing black chef, people that look like us, that were just killing it from a food standpoint. There's no egos. I mean, there was like, what do we have? Five of us, six of us in a very small kitchen. Yeah. And we just divided up and got busy. Yeah. And made sure that everybody was covered. Everybody was, you know, if if I was ahead, I'm looking around to say, hey, can I peel some potato? Can I do something, anything to get you going? Right. Um, Right. It was amazing, and it was probably my experience, my first experience as well, coming out there and doing a dinner like that with all black chefs in the kitchen. It's life changing for for sure, and it and it and when people come to us and say, "Oh, we can't work together," we're like, "No, that's not true," because we know that we can work together because we've done it within our collective time and time again, and we've put out some amazing meals all over the country all over the world, some of us have gone to the Caribbean, so we can work together. And that's what people need to see. We can work together. We, we can definitely work together. When I came back to Seattle um, and Erica came out, I think the second year we had it, uh, it was called Food is Art. Yeah. And what we did was brought together, um, again, the amazing black chefs in the city of Seattle to do this event. At that time, it was like 15 of us. I kid you not, the first meeting we had, people looked around the room. We looked at each other. First thing I heard was, I didn't know there were that many black chefs in Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> and it brought tears to your eyes. Because and it did. It was so amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And what it did was it built a really strong coalition. You could call it, um, you know, our own little chef's huddle here in Seattle that we are really super tight. Uh, we're looking out for each other. Um, I was you know, we'll, talk, we'll talk about that in a minute, but we're doing the Soul of Seattle, which is an amazing event. And you yeah. can see that you guys look out for each other too, because there's a lot of organic camaraderie amongst all of you all via social media. And so it's not like 
you know, event contrived camaraderie. You you see you guys sharing each other's posts, commenting on each other's things, hyping each other up, supporting each other. And especially over the last year, you know, you guys had it way, it was like this. So you it was like Seattle on that end and New York on that end. And then it's kind of converging this. Yeah. So you guys were dealing with it months before we started to deal with that. And the way that watching the Seattle chefs, the black chefs especially kind of pulled together was like, a, it was inspiring. Well, I mean, you, I mean, we all know the saying from Denny Myers, right? All boats rise together. You know, once we, once we had a couple of these food as art coming together, talking food, going into, now this is the cool thing. We actually would share kitchens. Like I would go to, um, um, like say Day Daisley's kitchen and hang out, Chef Daisley. Doing fr he did French food. Well, I wasn't doing French food, but I learned so much hanging out in his kitchen about how he handled his food, the flavors, how he put mixes together. Um, he's, he's amazing. His food he is, is he's so amazing. Such is your heart, yeah. You know, Chef Chef Eduardo Jordan. Right now, I've been able to you know go hang out at, at June Baby and Solari, sit at the counter, and just have discussion about how and. One, how he goes about his food. Two, the background and history of, of why he's using the foods that he does. Because he came up as well doing French and, and such. And now he's doing he's doing his Southern food. He's taking it to such a high, different level. Yeah, um, for sure. I, I love it, you know. And so you call, really call his food like a, a more of a Southern fusion of... Uh, well, French Southern fusion. Well, definitely, definitely at Solari. Yeah. But, but at June, baby, it, it's really leaning more Southern than anything else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I so. think I have a memory of um, we all were there. We had to <laughs> there. people. Huh? Wayne took us to dinner there. Yeah. Well, yes. I, what was, was it? Food? It was like 12 of us, 13 of us. Yeah. And yep. I, I got a little. I wanted the employee food. Right, that employee <laughs> I wanted what he had in the menu. He had like the fried chicken skins and all this other stuff. Just the mm -hmm. beautiful, you know, bowl Those of greens. He had some great meat. I remember that meal. Yeah, uh, that's the best great part meal. About, about coming there and all of our visits and all of our travels is that like when I didn't come with you and I came on my own and Wayne's like, Oh, I'm going to call chef so-and-so and you can go there tomorrow and, and going all around and being able to experience the other people's kitchens and, um, you know, and see what they're doing and, you know, experience their food and have conversations with them. We, we just need that. That's there. But what you guys do there is a model and I'm hoping that we, you know, as this podcast evolves, that we can kind of promote that com camaraderie and mentorship. Because even on level to, on level to level, you can learn from somebody. This is an ever evolving career. You don't know everything at any given moment. You're always learning. And there's not enough. I don't care what anybody says. There's not enough black-owned restaurants in the world that to feed everybody. Right. So we need to support and make sure that each of our restaurants are going to be successful and that we're mentoring. We all need to have somebody in our restaurant that's going to want to go out and open their own restaurant. Right. Yeah. Especially now. So let's move. We're going to scooch forward to, I think you started volunteering with Fair Start at the Mayflower when you were at the Mayflower or you were on the board. You're a volunteer or you were on the board? I was I when when I first got when I first was introduced to Fair Start, I was volunteering. So I was actually living in the hotel, waiting for my place to be, oh, to open. Let's say. Um, so it was two months in there, and every Sunday, Monday, to get a day off, I had to leave the hotel, or else it was like another work day. Right. So. <laughs> So I didn't really know anybody. I didn't really know. I knew a few of the chefs. I didn't know a lot of the chefs. Right. So I was introduced to Fair Start, and it was only three blocks from 
the hotel. So I would leave the hotel, walk three blocks, literally knock on the door, the back door, and say, hey, chef, if you need some hands, <laughs> you're not more than willing to hang out for a few hours. And sure enough, every time, yeah, come on in, chef. And what I found out was this program, so Fair Start, you know, we, we are a training program for people who have gone, had fallen on hard times, either living in poverty, um, coming out of incarceration, um, living homeless uh, through homelessness means right now. And what we're able to do is get them into the program. Well, let me take that back. We don't get them anywhere. They show up to be in the program. And you, you know, know they make that choice. Thing you guys do too, because this is going to help people understand your model. You also work with people who have gone through and not been successful with other programs, because yours is so much different than the way other traditional programs work. So yeah, I think I think the important thing about that, and that's a good point, Shana. We we are not just a, a culinary training program. We have tons of wraparound services. For, for folks coming in. I mean, we want to make it so that you don't have to think about how am I going to get to Fair Start Monday through Friday? We, we got a bus pass for you. We're not going to have you think about what am I going to wear? We, we have the uniforms. We, we have um, where they can get some, some clothes to take back home for themselves. You know, so the idea is we want to give you space just to focus on getting to where you want to go. Right. Um, we have life skills. And I think life skills is, for me, and I, I'm a culinarian, but I'm going to say this, is by far one of the best things that can happen in any program. Yeah. Because you're, you're setting up a foundation for them. So yes. that they actually rely on the, their own selves, which is. I, really can, I can teach you how to cook something. That doesn't mean you're going to be successful in life. Exactly. Right. Right. Yeah. So, so well, and then too, this whole career, this is a tough job. So you've got to have some people skills, some anger man way, ways to deal with or <laughs> in conflict resolution because this can, yes. a, this can be a. It's not an easy field to get into. So you guys do a really, really, really good job of looking at that whole person and really preparing them for, you know, all every aspect of what it looks like to be like a fun, a fully functioning, you know, self sufficient work person in society. And I, I think what's really, what helps us be really successful too, Shania, is, I, I mean, we're a 30 year program now. We've hit 30 years of doing this. I can tell you the first five years that I was going and volunteering and doing what we call guest chef nights, you know, chef from within the um, community would come in, work with the students to put out a, a beautiful meal on Thursday nights. So I did a, a bunch of those kind of meals as well. But I, I tell you what, <laughs> when I think about the first five years and, and now where we're at in year 30, getting the right community partners, the mm -hmm. right culinary people on our side, because I, I know not everybody that's going to go through the program is going to match up with every chef out there. Right. Yeah. So to be able to understand... Who, who can take a little more heat and yeah. a little less heat and who, yeah. who trains a little bit better or mentors a little bit better and matching that up has brought a lot of them up in the career and being more successful than if we just go, oh yeah, fill out your resume. We're going to send it to a bunch of people. Right. And good luck. <laughs> I feel that um, by being in Fair Start, what, how many times, how many years back to back that we've gone up there um I your staff three years right in a row right in a row yeah but your staff is the kindest most patient staff i've ever 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 dealt with i mean oh, um, oh they love when i say that y'all coming oh they're like what day i want to be working and wait <laughs> what time are they gonna be there well i don't care if they're coming at five in the morning i want to be there Right, right, right. Yeah, you, know, you so funny for me yeah. when you said that. So this is the year you couldn't come, and I went. And so Wayne had assigned me like a a uh, head. We're gonna call him my like head volunteer. And so, mm -hmm. so I come in and get my speed card all together. 
girl, he guarded that speed card with his life. Okay. <laughs> with his life. He was like, girl, they tried, they tried to take your butter, but I made sure he was on my stuff. Like that y'all cannot touch her stuff. This is not for you. Don't be messing with these cards. So he he took care of my stuff. He was so happy. Anything that we needed, he was like on, on it, on it, on it, on it, on it. And I was like, see? You have amazing, you have amazing students also. I mean, they're very open, very they're willing to learn as much as they possibly can to a point where, you know, oh, can I taste that? You know, and you know I love to feed people. And so does Shanice. <laughs> so you know, here, you want some more sugar? Here you go. But um, I I just, it's very overwhelmingly pleasant and surprising and open-hearted place to be as a chef who's running all the time and has 10,000 things going on. And then you walk into your kitchen, you have 10,000 things going on and you're like, wow, reality check and everybody's happy and everybody's nice and i'm going to take a little bit of this with me to my kitchen and that's, that's what right. you, you've given us that experience and every place that you've gone from mayflower to rays to to fair start all your staff you have been a, an amazing executive chef and mentor to these people and you rub off onto your staff and it's amazing i just want to say thank you and i think people need to hear that yeah um, thank you i appreciate that um and and i think it <laughs> it starts with how do you want to be treated yeah and when you come from that space what you're putting out there yeah back 100 fold right for but sure. you have to be consistent with it. You can't be one day. The tyrant, and the next day a sweetie pie. Yeah, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. And the next day, you know, I, I'm having a bad day, so I'm like taking it out. I need to get in the cooler first before I talk to anybody, <laughs> straighten myself out, and then come out and, you know, let's be on terms about what our day is about. Because it's about that. It's not about you and me. No, for sure. But and I think that what the way that you kind of organize your kitchen and the culture that you create, it, I almost feel like that because of the, the style of culinarians that you guys are training, it's like permeating throughout the industry there. And it's kind of overall changing the culture, which, you know, whenever people ask me, like, what do I feel like needs to change post COVID? I was like, kitchen culture needs to change. It's not healthy. And it's not a good environment for people to work in. And you can't tell me that the only way for people to be productive is when you're like in this intensely stressful, you know, prickly environment where people are like on edge and ready to jump out of their skin at any given moment. Because you guys have the downstairs basement area that y'all are got meals going out of down there. You've got the middle level that's doing catering and then the restaurant. And then they've got upstairs has got all of the classrooms and the services and the this and the that. Um, then you have, um, sorry, then you have um, your, now you have all the annexes, all the little concepts all over. And then you have the kids building. You can't manage to do all of that with, and you're not yelling and screaming and hollering at people and people can't say that that's the only way that you can work in this career. That's just not true. Oh, they'd be all gone if you did that. <laughs> I mean, I mean, right? Because it's it's a training program. It's about the mission. Right. So those that are coming in, you know, there's there's two truly aspects that I believe they have to have. One is they they have to want to um, be a mentor. They have to want to almost coddle the students. And not just the students, right. but their staff member too. We have right. to be kind to each other. And then the second thing is, we're in the food business still. You got to have a love for food. Right. Or you got to go. Right. <laughs> like Shanice, Chef Shanice was just saying it. I don't want no angry, agitated food going to my customer. Right. No, I don't. Keep your angry <laughs> salad in you're in the back. Nobody wants to eat all that bad energy. So how have you guys, we're going to spend the last part talking about just the way that you guys have, I want to say led 
um, throughout this whole COVID emergency meal situation because, you know, I've definitely throughout my whole entire the prospect journey, I'm like, Wayne, what are y'all doing? Wayne, what about this? <laughs> Wayne, <laughs> can you help me? Ah! <laughs> How many meals did you say you did? Well, dang, I haven't done that much. You know, I'm quite quite, quite competitive. And then I know you are. I was like, there's no way in hell I'm keeping up with them. So let me just stop. It's not going to happen. Once you got over like the 100,000 mark, I was like, yeah, it's not happening. I'm just going to keep plugging away the way that I'm going. But you guys have really been, it could speak to the 30 years that that FAIR, I almost want to say that FAIR start probably just the way that the program is designed was built for this because you've been in this space you 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 know all of the players. You know how that that moves and and how it worked, the inner working. So it was probably a really quick pivot. And how to have you guys? Um, one, how did you start it? And then where are you guys are now? And also, do you sleep? Well, yeah, yes, that has to happen. <laughs> self to self self care rest. is very important. You know, he does not play about his rest. <laughs> but but I do have to say, you know. Um, we were built on, you know, we were built on feeding the shelters. Yeah. Our our founding chef <clears throat> would go down and feed the shelters. Then we became a training program to train those that wanted to, you know, move out of the situations that they were in, um, have a little self autonomy as far as being able to have money to spend knowing where their next meal was coming from, be able to have the, uh, their own house over their head. So we were, yes, we've done that for years, um, <clears throat> feeding the shelters, feeding the hospital, hospitals, feeding the, the school system. Um, so when COVID hit, it was almost a natural thing for us to ask, how can we help? And we're probably the most experienced ones in the city to right. do it. <laughs> You're like, hey, we got this over here. We're just dusting off our old playbooks from the right before. So then it's like, <laughs> yeah, it's like, how can one, this food isn't free, regardless. Two, how can we get funding to one, because we have to keep, you know, 120 employees employed in order to do this. Right. When we start putting out like seven thousand meals, anywhere between five and eight thousand meals a day. Every one of our kitchens, you, you mentioned the restaurant kitchen. We turned that the downstairs kitchen, which was doing mostly shelters, turned that the um, catering kitchen, turned that all into emergency feeding. And I know you're probably going, well, you just basically created a whole conveyor of food going from one in and out, you know. Well, there's a lot involved in that too, right? There was a whole lot of farms that was not able to move food because right. all the restaurants closed down. Yeah. So we had to get with the city, we had to get with the county, had to get with these farmers, and a lot of them just wanted to get it out. I mean, but they had they to gonna lose it anyway if they if they hadn't given it out, right? Yeah, so so we started taking that, um, working with them, the like county, city, we're helping them to at least kind of break even. They weren't making any money, you know. They don't you generally don't anyway, right? But anyway, that food started coming, so we were able to take that, turn it into dignified food to serve to those that were underserved. Can you pause? Right? We're going to talk about something you said yes. that is my pet peeve with some of the places that I've seen in my region. Dignified food. Please, let's, you gotta explain to the people what that means. Okay, if, 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 if I go to, well, we kind of hit on it a little bit. We hit the fringe of it, meaning I'm not gonna send you angry food to anybody. <clears throat> the second aspect of it is um, just because I'm living in a shelter doesn't mean I should get any less quality food than somebody that's having a wedding. Yeah, thank you. Can you. I feel like you might need to repeat that again for the people <laughs> in the back row. All right. <laughs> so people, 
They're living in shelters, living in tents, deserve the same food, the same quality. I don't care if it's chicken, potato, sweet potato, whatever you want to call it. It needs to look the same, feed the same. And actually, when you think about it, when you start thinking about the nutritional aspect of it, those that are underserved probably need the more nutritious food than some others. And yes, I'm just going to say it. <laughs> no, it, it's the God honest truth because this is a public health crisis. And the people who are impacted the most are the people who are relying on our services for food. And if we continue to serve them crap, how do we expect them to boost their immune systems and fight off any type of disease outside of COVID-19? You, yeah. you can give them all the health care you want to give them. You can give them all the whatever. But I keep telling people 85% of what happens in your body has to do with two things, what you put in it and what you put on it. That's mm -hmm. it. <laughs> on your skin or what's going on the outside of your body and what is going on, what are you putting on the inside of your body? If you want to cure yourself, you probably need to look at what you're putting on your skin and what you're putting in your body. That That's really it. Well, well it's really interesting because anybody that's on this call, go two and a half days without eating and see if you can think straight. Right, right. You know, so if you're not eating what well, nutritiously, and then and when what you're for two and a half days, why don't you make your first meal a cup of coffee and donuts? You see how you feel right. after you haven't eaten for two and a half days, and the first thing you get is donuts and coffee. See how you feel then. That's right. That's right. So yeah, when you're when we're thinking about, and I will say it one more time, we're thinking about feeding these emergency meals. I can guarantee you, you could open up that package and you wouldn't know who that was actually going to. Because yeah. it could be going to anybody in the city and they would be happy to receive that. And they would think that they would know that they were getting dignified. They were looked at as somebody we cared about. Um, yes, I can't even tell you that. that it's kind of getting under me a little bit to think yeah. about that. People don't realize that. And, and then they'll, they'll say, especially when you work in our black and brown communities, when you go and volunteer there, I hear it all the time. Well, they're not going to eat that. Mm. How? Because our if it, if it looks good and smells good, they're going to eat it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I like That's not possible because we, we interviewed a chef on the first season who's in Compton, California, and she volunteers at four food kitchens that are fully plant-based vegan. In Compton. So you can't tell me that, oh, so only the black people and the brown people in Compton eat plant based food and not anywhere else in the whole country. That's, I just don't, I don't like that. And that's one of the things that I have been seeing, you know, throughout the whole pandemic. And I feel like you guys focus on that nutritional literacy. People have to understand how to eat better. They have right. to. They have to. And and education is part of it. It's a huge part of it. And as we as we continue to, you know, before I go that far, I, I just want to go real quickly about you know culturally appropriate food for different communities. It's not that hard to do either. So we don't have to give them this meal that maybe they will or will not eat when we know that they eat. This, I mean, like, if I'm serving, if I'm serving a, a halal community, I'm gonna serve them dignified halal food. Right. You know, if I'm if I'm in um, you know, a, a a black community, it may not be fried, but I know what foods that we can make nutritionists and they can eat and will eat because they they know what chicken is, they know what greens are. It's it's how how does it taste, right? That's really what that, that's our jobs as chefs. That's our jobs. <laughs> so I we have to educate too. We have I to educate. Agree. We have to educate, and I'm gonna and I spend my time screaming it from the mountaintops. Like no, no, you don't have to serve that. <laughs> they can they they will eat better than that. <laughs> you can do better. Yeah, we um. You know, you you say you were calling at different times when pandemic hit, and 
how are we pivoting and, and how are we keeping our kitchen safe and what's the protocols we were writing and, and things of that nature. And um, our, I, you know, I'm happy to say that we, ha I mean, we're like 2.6, almost 2.7 million meals since wow. last March. That's amazing. That gives me chills. I'm like, <laughs> God. <laughs> yeah, it takes your breath away. And, and it's just uh, amazing that you've set up a system to put that many meals out from. And these are healthy, dense, you know, beautifully presented meals. Yeah, there's no we're, we're not we're not putting junk in snacks. We're not put we're not putting junk anywhere. You're going to get a snack. It's going to be healthy. But you yeah. never even before the pandemic, you were never putting out junk meals anyway. You know, no, so not about it at all. Not you were just it. carrying on your, you know, your excellence of food for from the shelters to now through the pandemic. So, you know, we wouldn't expect you to do anything less than than what you were already doing. So know? I saw online that you guys are still doing emergency meals. Are you doing as many now or has that have you pulled back on that? Because I did see that they were going back into like virtual class sessions and trying to get back into the the day to day of you know yeah so we we are doing virtual training now <clears throat> it hasn't changed um how much food is going out of our kitchens mm -hmm. um and the only thing that's probably really going to change that i mean food security is really hard right now and a lot of people are suffering you know and not only just not eating right but some are not even eating um so there's a lot of areas that we need to look at. I mean, food banks, it's great. They get a lot of food in, but we have prepared food. People can actually take it and eat it, right? So, right. Um, so that's the other thing that bugs me is that people assume that under resource. So I was on a, a urban food summit call. And the, we were in our little breakout session and the lady's like, well, we tried to give away turkeys and we found a lot of them in the trash. And I said, well, did it ever occur to you that they did not have the capability to prepare a whole turkey? Because no person who is hungry is going to intentionally throw out food. The only way that they would throw it, if there's a refrigeration problem, if yeah. they have the uh, oven or a way to make the turkey into smaller parts to cook it or they don't have the pans or there's all these different variables so what you guys do is you're kind of removing the thought from the person about how am i going to store prepare it's, it's almost going back to what i said when when i was trying to figure out what was going in the garbage i had to change that system because it didn't make sense so if they have something going in the garbage, who's standing there asking the question, why are you not taking this? Because they're going to tell you. Right. You know, and when something comes back on the plate, <clears throat> if I go out and ask, why is why is that asparagus coming back? And they say, I don't like it. Duh, then don't put it on the plate. Right. Right. So if they're not going to eat, if they can't, if they're throwing the turkey away. One, find out if they need prepared food, give them something that's ready to eat and take that turkey back and cook it and make it something that they can eat. That's right. what I said. Why didn't y'all cook the turkeys and cut them up and give them to them already prepared? Then they could have heated them and they wouldn't have had to worry about that. So, so that's, that's part of the, that's part of what we're recognizing in, in food banks where we can service them better by, by bringing in, the nutritious food, turn it into a, a beautiful meal mm -hmm. that is either frozen or ready to eat. Because maybe some don't have microwaves as well, right? right? So thinking through that process, but then there are those that want a hot meal. They have a microwave. They can take microwave it and have a nice hot meal. So figuring out, yeah, I'm, you're absolutely right. Figuring out where, what the needs are, how can they handle it, and servicing that need and not just putting something out there just to say, I put it out there. Right. That doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't make sense. So how did you guys navigate 
this, and I know that's probably something that you're dealing with there, but we deal with it here a lot is the digital divide. So, you know, the reason why I, with the prospect, we put our, we didn't launch any classes is because we couldn't really navigate people getting access. Not everybody in our city has internet access. And so that, well, I was like, that's just another stumbling block and a barrier. And I don't want to put people in a position where they've got one more thing, you know, on their plate to think about. Because last year, at the beginning of the pandemic, all the internet companies, everybody's like, free broadband, we're going to help you. We're going to get anybody who needs internet for virtual school or whatever, we'll make sure you have it. That was last year. This year, they're like, we ain't giving away nothing for free. <laughs> you all got to pay for this. So how did you guys navigate that? Yeah, I think we're, we're still in the, the aspect of our, our donors are supporting that the broadband that our, our trainees, our students are able to learn online. Um, we've, we've been blessed enough to have some donors actually um, donate the, the laptops that they need to do the training. Um, nice. So, so we've, you know, we've built a, the, the system that has really helped us out in the long run. I don't know if next year they're going to say that and we're going to have to pivot and, and do something different. But um, at this point, we're, we're still, Plugging along with um, being able to have the services for our um, our trainees, and I'd, I'd love to figure out um, and work with you on what we got going on, and how we can make sure that maybe that broadband issue is not an issue for those trying to, you know, go through your training program. Yeah, it it could definitely be an issue. So then, where do you see you guys going next? Like we're I mean, let's be realistic. I was talking to someone in Europe, a friend, and they're like, we think 2023, 2024 before life is, you know, and I hate to say that out loud, but I like to think in like real terms because really, yeah. you know, if we, if we look at what's happening in this country, you've got the middle class. It's like an avalanche. At first in the pandemic, they were sliding into the working poor, but now it's become like a cliff and people are like falling off that cliff by the hundreds of thousands. It seems like well, every single week. And those well, numbers are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, you know, there's a lot of people living in their house right now. And once the relief program's over, they, they're not going to be able to pay back a year's worth of <laughs> rent. It's not going to happen. That's homelessness right there. That's just putting... So that's got to be figured out before that happens. That's the, that's my, the cliff. I'm just in my little area. This is just little Overland Park. 330,000 people at yes. the end of March will be facing eviction. And I think what I read, like a national average, people owe an average about $7,500 in back rent. And and a lot of them have not been well, not a lot, but a number of them have not been able to work. Mm -hmm. So it's not like they're saving all this money waiting to, to have to pay it off. They they don't have it. Right, and the people and people people keep saying, "Well, why aren't they working?" I was like, "Because it's our industry, people. <clears throat> it's hospitality people. It's mu gig musicians. It's venue employees. It's you know banquet servers." who work at the big, you know, for the big staffing companies and the big hotels. It's, you know, it's all of those people who rely on a robust hospitality system to live and make a living. And it is not robust anymore. Right, right. And, and, and when, when is the whole restaurant energy going to, you know, industry going to be able to rebound? You said 23, 24, right. we're, we're, we're praying for that. Right. That's so, being hopeful. Yeah, that is being hopeful. So I, I, we're kind of getting down to our, our time, but I, I really want you to, um, Chef Wayne, tell us about your project that is going on in Seattle, Soul of Seattle. Please tell us about that. I'm, yeah, I'm really excited. Every time I see you um, sharing it on Facebook, I share it too. I oh, thank in, you. I get a little more coming. And I wish we were there so that we could celebrate that. This, this what is it, a week-long event or two-week event? 
Probably four. Four weeks event? The whole month of February? So the, whole, the whole month of February. So we started, and I know we're, we're late announcing this. I mean, it's the 17th, but, um, you know, week one, it started. So here's the, how the whole thing has gone. And the Soul of Seattle is actually only in its second year. Mm-hmm. The first year was last year. Right before. But the- I think I mentioned earlier, and I, I'm just going to roll back a little bit. Um, when I said food is art. So a lot of the chefs that were part of food is art are now part of Soul of Seattle. That's awesome. Um, That's a so great anyway, people. Yeah, Chef Eduardo Jordan last year said, we, we need to do something. You know, we need to do something. We need to uh, bring in money to support those young black students who are having something, whatever it is, holding them back. You know, we need to figure out a way to fund organizations that are, are lifting them up. Um, so last year, we, we pulled it together in about three and a half months. It was, it was insane. But it happened. Uh, we raised about $260,000 or something like that. That's amazing. We, we had um, the African American Museum full of folks throughout the whole building. I think we had something like 350 people and probably up to 600 roaming in and out. So we had different food stations set up. So this was a coming together and we're just like, oh my God, we can't wait till next year because we only did it in three months and we really could have probably made it a lot better and COVID hit. So yes, we had an earlier start, but now it's a virtual. Yeah. Soul of Seattle. And week one, we had, um, so auction started on Friday, went throughout the whole week, or Saturday, went throughout the whole week, and on Friday, it ended. Um, and then on Friday, we had a virtual cooking demo with um, Where You At, Matt, was hosting it. We had Chef um, Dre, who is a amazing chef that just lives over in one of the islands up here in Seattle, Bashan Island. And then we also had Sabrina Tinsley from La Spiga. And it was amazing. It was just the most beautiful thing. And then week two came. So same thing. Saturday, start the auction. Runs all week long. So you can auction and check on your bid throughout the week. Nice. And then on Friday, we had the virtual um, National Black Chefs led by Marcus Samuelson. Right. And it was just an amazing conversation about everything that's going on from COVID to um, how we need to mentor and take care of the young ones coming up, how we're going about it. It it was just a beautiful conversation. So now starting last Saturday, the auctions again, this Friday, the 19th, everybody mark your calendars, the 19th, myself is going to be hosting virtual cooking demo. It's going to be, and I know you've had her on the show before, Chef Christy Brown. Yes, yes, yes. Going to be, it's going to be doing this amazing, amazing gumbo. And then we have Chef Trey from the Jerk Shack, which is, again, just down home southern Good. food. Yeah, he's doing it. Wait, did we go there? Huh? We went to the Jerk Shack, I think. Yes, we did. Yes, we did. You guys did. We, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't go with you guys at, at that time, but I've been there. Yeah. yeah. So so he's going to be doing um, some seafood fritters. So mm-hmm. we're going to have an amazing time um, chatting it up, talking about what's going on, how each of them are doing different things to support the community. Um, I know Christy was doing, as soon as it, when it first hit, was doing a bunch of just meals. She's yeah. still in, I think, but just not as many days. Right, because now they got communion open. Yeah, and they're trying to run their restaurant. So, yeah. um, but it's just, it's just been this beautiful thing, and uh, uh, Trey is trying to open up a jerk shack too, okay. which is going to be mentoring young blacks in the culinary world. He's putting it in the south end of Seattle, where where it's needed. Right. Right. <laughs> He's putting things in Seattle. Well, if folks are being down south, that's a that's a journey now. Just to get to work and back. Yeah. So so he wants to start doing that. So we're gonna have a big conversation about 
how that's going to happen, what kind of support he needs, and then um, uh, move on from that. And then the last week, so then Saturday again, we'll start the auction, go all week till Friday. And then on the so 26th, mark your calendars, um, Chef DJ Questlove is going to turn it's everybody's so awesome. everybody's house into a virtual <laughs> dance floor. It's going to be amazing. Of course it is. You guys really pulled together an amazing event. Um, so so four weeks of exciting. Black History Month and, and honoring, you know, even honoring, I think we have to remember this, those that have done this struggle before us, mm -hmm. um, you know, I was talking to one of the um, staff members earlier today, and I said, did you even know, like, George Washington's chef, Hercules, was black? Nope. So I think that we can't forget to talk about that and, and lift up that there are people that have really worked hard on <laughs> This whole black culinary scene, which is why it's so important for us to work to to work and get the proper education and the degrees, so that we can continue to take back control of our narrative and be and be in position to tell our stories. It's just that it's important. This 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 food thing this food thing was built on black chefs yeah. in America, <laughs> and we haven't given the credit. I feel, we I feel that COVID really. And you know, Shanita knows I, I say this almost every time that we have a conversation. COVID has given us all the opportunity to step back and and, and take a realization of what is important. You know, our history is important. Our self-care is important. Um, our food is important, you know, but at the same time, just knowing who we are, where we come from, we are actually taking that time to actually figure all that out. And we're not doing it by ourselves, we're doing it together. And yeah. we have to continue that. We have to continue to reach out across the nation as we're doing now, talking to each other, lifting each other up. And, you know, I'm saying right now, Chef Chanel, you need me out there, you call. You know? <laughs> every week, every month, he's like, you still don't have any men on your board. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> he's trying to tell you something. Let me tell you something. He's like, you don't have any male board members. What are you doing? I'm like, it's not intentional. You, but, you, not you, you, so, but that just that just goes to show that just goes to show that I'm looking and I'm caring. There you and go. I'm making sure that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I checked the site again. There's still no male board members. I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm working on it. So if anybody is watching. I, I think we might have a volunteer that's already on the show. <laughs> if you want to be on my board, hit me up. I'm looking, I'm looking at you. He's looking at you. He's telling you something. I feel the message. Do you hear the message? I feel it. But we don't want to wear Chef Wayne out, fellas. Don't have him going into the volunteer. Lane. He so, volunteered. He would never volunteer if he couldn't handle it. So I know that for Norma. Oh. My, 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 my title now is advisor, so um, there you go. The phone. <laughs> there you go. Advisor, he's our advisor, and I, we'll put your. He'll be the only advisory board member with a picture, so it'll entice <laughs> us. <laughs> <laughs> so it will entice other males. Like, oh look, there's a, there's one. Okay, I can do this. Hey, we just want to make sure, you know, I'm this, I'm, we're deep into this DE&I work, and I want to make sure, you know, you got that diversity, equity, and inclusion happening across people. How, how we think, how we act, how we be, right? Yeah, it definitely, and that's a good point to bring up. Diversity and inclusion is just not about skin color and sexual orientation. I mean, and sexual preference. It, it, you need the proper amount of male and female perspective as well. It, I know we're I know we're opening up a whole another can of worms. It sounds like it's a, another uh, a show. It's a whole but, another hour. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Last question. Go yeah. for it. What does Chef Wayne of 2020 go back and tell Chef Wayne when he's leaving Junction City to start his culinary journey? Wow. So of 2020, going back to. Junction City. So you're talking about. I mean, the span of your career. If there's, if you could go back at where you are now and give yourself advice 
in the beginning. Like I would tell myself that I don't take shit so seriously. Like, well, my mine would probably be close to that. It would be believe in yourself. Because a lot of people tell you a lot of things, and you know what in your heart, your soul, you know what works, what feels good. And just because someone else, whether it's parent, whether it's teacher, <laughs> say, don't do that. Um, I think you have to. I think you have to stay true to yourself. Yeah. You really do. You know, yeah. and and work hard at it, and it, it will take care of itself. You know, my my, I could have been a lot of things. You know, I mean, I studied business and accounting, and you know what what resonated was cooking and being a chef and being around people and and lifting people up. You know, I love love love. Um, watching people get the aha, you know? Yes. It's, 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 it's beautiful. Yes, it is. And you know what you said that if I, if, if I could go back and I kind of look back over all of the, you know, these in the career where it wasn't a quite a straight path, it, it probably came down to a decision where I doubted myself and I didn't trust that like gut instinct and I was swayed one way or the other off mm -hmm. of what I knew that I needed to do. And so I don't regret those ways, but you know, now when you look back, you're like, you know what happens when you don't trust yourself. You yeah. end up making like a going on a around the block when you could have just gone down the street. Yeah, but you know, I don't I, yes, I hear that. And I, I don't want to discount the the learnings from yeah. um the the, the failures and the mistakes, you know, those have lifted us up too, because I, I, well, made, some, so I made some pretty bad dishes. Who you are. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's, that's, that's what builds dish. who you are, your character, the person that you've become today, that kind, loving, um, inspirational person that you are, Chef Wayne. Um, I, and we, I feel the same way. I think that's what I said last week. You know, if I had trust my, my inner self, and mm -hmm. that I was, I should have done at 18. <laughs> we still would have known each other. All three of us still would have known each other. I just would have went a different journey. And yeah. I, I feel that it probably would have been I mean, maybe even more of a, a greater journey. But um, if you don't trust who you are and, and your your own intuitions, I I think that's what we need to start telling our babies, you know? Trusting yourself, believe in what that little voice you hear in your head, that strong little voice and run with it, you know? Yeah. So. And, and how can we support that, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's always a part of the, the conversation. And that's the thing I like about Chef Wayne. He always ends it with, and how can we support that? Right. Other people do always. Yeah. Because we have to stop acting like, and this is our last thing, as chefs of color, that we're on an island and that we're out here as minority chefs and we're out here and we're doing it all by ourselves and we're you know we're doing we're doing whatever. I feel like that all of the dips and turns and difficulties that I've encountered have made a little bit of a smoother path from somebody coming behind me. Now is it you know new highway smooth? No. There might be a couple potholes, but it's it's not un, it's not a dirt road in the woods. It's not in the woods because Erica went and knocked the trees down before me. I <laughs> her and put a little gravel or whatever and then you know that's how that's how we have to look at it we all everybody has their role to play and and helping somebody else come up behind us well, well said. thank you for having us on our, on the show having you on our show thank you for being on the show thank you for your kind and most um inspirational words and we got to bring you back on all your COVID hard work, you know that I am a big fan of the work that you guys are doing um, in Fair Start. If I had like a magic wand, I'd be like, you know, you guys are just doing amazing work. And I love how you guys have been supported and been consistent in the community. So, well, and we're going to, we're going to continue. We will continue the work and through our partners, partners, partners like you that are helping do the work across the country, because that's what's going to be important. Great. We can get done in Seattle, but 
we're, we got, we're just one, we're just one we're just one one fair start, right? <laughs> yep, we got to get it done everywhere. So That's with right. that, guys, we thank you guys for watching us. It's the conversation. Um, we will be back next Wednesday at six thirty Central. I don't remember who we have next Wednesday. Do you remember? I believe it is uh, Chef Andrew Black. Ooh, okay. Ooh. Uncle Oklahoma City. From where? Um, Oklahoma City. Oh, we're going to Oklahoma next we're week. Going to Oklahoma. That's yeah, probably all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, he'll have thawed out, and the power will be back on. I have another friend, yeah. a friend in Oklahoma, and their power has been out all day. So, yeah, we'll you guys wow. next week. Fingers crossed with Chef Andrew Black. Thank you, guys. All right. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thanks for having.